You know, it is such a such a blessing to be able to come into the Lord's house to sing songs of praise. And we are very diligent around here, very prayerfully um, focused on the songs that we sing and making sure that they are rich in doctrine and sound doctrine and theology, that they are an expression of our love and our adoration and our worship towards God. Music is a blessing. It is a grace of God that he has given to us in order to sing to him, to make a joyful noise unto him. I don't know if you realize it or not, but the Bible is full of songs of praise. The book of Revelation gives us songs of praise that are sung in heaven. The book of Psalms, of course, is the hymn book of songs that celebrate God's work of redemption. Well, so far in Luke's gospel account, we are a church who studies verse by verse through books of the Bible, and we are in Luke's gospel. We have seen two songs of praise from Elizabeth and from Mary. And today we are going to see our third song of praise from Zechariah. Remember, Zechariah is John the Baptist's father. And last week we studied the account where John was just born, and he is the prophesied one who will be coming announcing Christ as the Messiah. The beautiful thing about Zechariah's song is it is a song reflecting upon the salvation that God brings to all who come by faith. His song is rooted deeply in the Old Testament and focuses on the three great covenants that God has made, the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, and of course, the new covenant of God sending his son, as the final payment for our sins. We will see that his words in this song give us a clear picture that Christianity isn't something new, but it is a fulfillment of all of the things that the Old Testament is pointing towards. Simply put, the Messiah is coming soon. His song is an understanding that his son John is the prophesied prophet who would come announcing Jesus as the Messiah. The events are starting to fall into place and God is about to usher in his son, the spotless, blameless lamb of God. Let's read our passage today. And this is what it says. It says, and his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied saying, blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he has visited and redeemed his people and raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Now this term prophesied simply means to speak forth, to proclaim God's word. The Holy Spirit was speaking through him, the truth of God's word. And Zechariah starts out here, by blessing God, by blessing God. And I just wanna stop and I just wanna say, that's what we're all called to do. Our prayers, our lives, our church. The reason why we are here today is to bless God. That's why the church isn't about us. It's not about us. But we have made the church in America today about the people. We have sold out in the church today to entertainment. We have sold out in thinking that God's word is not enough. So we have replaced the pulpit with motivational speeches, verses that are ripped out of context while a strong personality of a pastor is parading around the stage saying things and preaching things that really have nothing to do with the passage of God's word. We have sold out to consumerism in the church today where we have made everything about us. Church, it's not about us. It is about coming in and singing songs of praise to God, to opening up his holy word and proclaiming the truth of his word to the church. We gather, we live We have breath in our lungs to bless God. Now let's take a look at why Zechariah praised God in this song. Zechariah praised God because he had visited his people and redeemed his people. 
Not only had God saved his nation, Israel, and called them to himself, he was now sending his son Jesus to be the final sacrifice for all who would come to him in faith and repentance. He glorified God because in this song, God has accomplished our redemption through Christ. And that is the greatest news ever, that we were in total bondage of our sins, unable to save ourselves, in wrong standing before holy and righteous God and deserving of hell. But God in his grace accomplished through us or through his son, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, a way for us to be reconciled to him. Zechariah knew that Jesus was on his way and all of these things were unfolding. And he was praising God for God's work of salvation. Zechariah praised and glorified God because he had raised up a horn of salvation through the house of his servant, David. Now this reference to a horn is simply metaphoric of a strong horned animal. Zechariah is using this metaphor, speaking of Jesus as coming and God using his power as he is sovereign and strong and, and most powerful over all to take out the threat of danger. God who is almighty and powerful has overcome sin, death, and the grave for all who would come to Christ. Zechariah also knew the, <clears throat> knew the Old Testament well. He knew that the Messiah would come from the house of David. He knew that Mary was from the line of David. And in his song of praise, he praises God for sending the promised Messiah through the line of David. If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times at this church. When we read the Old Testament, when we read Old, Old Testament passages, we don't wanna read these passages and insert ourselves as the heroes in these passages. You might be saying, well, what are you talking about? Well, let me give you an example. David and Goliath is probably one of the most popular stories in the Old Testament. And here's what we like to do as selfish people, is we like to insert ourselves as the hero of that story. We like to, to say things like, we need to be like David. We need to go gather our three stones and go slay all of the giants in our lives. We need to, to muster up the courage to be these brave people and go and slay the giants in our lives. But let me tell you, when we look at this story with a Christ-centered focus, the story, the account is totally different. We see this massive giant, this, this man who is nine feet tall, 10 feet, who knows how tall he was exactly, standing there and nobody can overcome this Goliath. And David steps in and he takes out this thing that seemed impossible to overcome. Well, as you begin to see Jesus in the Old Testament, you see that David is a picture of Jesus here. In fact, he overcame, David overcame this massive, massive obstacle that seemed impossible to overcome. A giant that nobody could defeat. What does that sound like in our lives? Sounds like sin, death, and the grave. And that is what Jesus has overcome for us. We see that the passage is Christ overcoming the greatest giant, and that was sin, death, and the grave, conquering what you and I could never conquer on our own. See, we love to read ourselves and make ourselves the heroes of the Bible. Many very poor sermons have been preached telling you to be like David, go and gather your stones and overcome the giants in your life. When you need to understand that you can't overcome the giants in your life without Christ. 
He is the one who has overcome, overcame the biggest giant, and that is sin, death, and the grave. All the prophets were pointing to Christ. And once you begin to have a Christ-centered focus when reading God's word from Genesis 1 to Revelation, you see Jesus in everything. And that is the picture of God's redemption. And by the way, I've never heard anyone, anybody say, be like David, go have an affair, get the lady pregnant, and then try and cover it up by having her husband murdered. Because that's also what David did. We hear these sermons and we hear these focuses on be like David, be like Daniel, be like Jesus, be like Jesus. These are a foreshadowing of the coming Messiah. And that is what Zechariah is doing here in this outburst of song and and, and praise and adoration towards God is, is praising God for salvation. Going back to verse 71, we have some language that I wanna focus on. I wanna read to you again. It says that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. See, God's promises will never fail. Christ's kingdom will have no end, unlike David's or Solomon's, or let's even funnel it down to us today, our little kingdoms that we've built upon this earth. All that we see is going to come to an end. Being a part of God's kingdom comes with a price tag, and that is hatred from this world. But even more so in this context, many of the Jews would hate, despise, and reject Christ as Messiah, just as many of them do today. The Savior of the world, the prophesied one, sent to die for the sins of God's people, would be arrested, wrongfully tried, and sentenced to die a criminal's death and hung upon a cross to die. They executed their king. And even though many would reject Jesus as Messiah, God's promises will never be changed. One day King Jesus will return to establish his earthly kingdom, just as God promised David. And in that day, God has a remnant from his nation, Israel, that will come to faith and repentance in him. Just like he has a remnant now in Israel, just like he has a remnant now in America, just like he has a remnant now of believers all across the world. One day, Israel will turn and mourn over their rejection of Christ as Messiah. I didn't give this passage to them in the back, but I I encourage you to to, to open up to it. It's Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And this is a a prophecy uh, from Zechariah in looking ahead to when Israel will look upon and realize that they rejected Christ as Messiah. And this is what it says. It says, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weeps bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. See, this was prophetic. This is speaking Ahead And God speaking through the prophet Zechariah saying that one day the nation Israel and God's remnant from his chosen nation will look back and they will weep bitterly. They will see that they pierced the Messiah, that they are the ones who put him to death. That's kind of for another sermon. So I'm not going to take a whole lot of time focusing on that today. So let's draw back into our passage. To sum it up, Zechariah here is celebrating salvation. He's celebrating salvation. The salvation that many of this room 
have in Christ and Christ alone. The same salvation that the current and the future Jews will have in Christ. God does not forget his promises. Let me ask you this question. How were people saved in the Old Testament? How are people saved in the Old Testament? A lot of crickets in the room, right? You know the answer. It's not not a trick question. They were saved by, by God's grace and through faith. See, they looked ahead to the coming Messiah. They looked ahead to the promised Messiah who was going to come. And what are we doing today? We are looking back to the coming, the incarnation, the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. We look back to the coming of Christ, but we all look forward to the second coming of Christ where he will come to be the sovereign ruler over all as he already is, but he will come to return for his church. He will come in judgment of all who have rejected him as Messiah. He will come as the judge and the ruler and the king of kings and the Lord of lords, which he already is. And church, I just want to remind you today, that's why we gather. We don't gather to give you an experience. We gather to worship God. We gather today to sing the song of salvation. That is why our Our team works so hard, prayerfully, carefully behind the scenes of of prayerfully even considering the songs that we sing, that those songs are rich in theology and sound doctrine. And they're not focusing on us, but they're focusing on the sovereignty and the attributes and the love and the grace and the mercy and the wrath and the forgiveness and the grace of God. And as we declare these songs and we sing these songs, We're not singing them to entertain you. We're not singing them to build a church brand. We are singing them to the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We sing this salvation. We preach this salvation. That is why we preach the way that we do here, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We unpack and unleash and and share with you the truth of God's word every single week. And then we are called to not hoard this salvation, this gospel message to ourselves. We are called to go unto all nations and to share this gospel message. Well, the question for you today simply becomes, becomes this. Here's the application for you. The question becomes is, are you, are you saved? Do you share in this song of salvation with Zechariah today? Do you share in this song of salvation that we sang with the praise and worship team earlier with me? Because I share it with many of you today, those who have come in faith and repentance to Christ and Christ alone that you have thrown yourself as a wretched, filthy sinner at the foot of the cross and you recognize that there is nothing good in you at all and you desperately need a savior and that Jesus is that only savior who came to die. But not only did he came to die, he came to live the life that you could not live, a life of perfect righteousness, a life of, of no sin, of no lust, of no lying, of no cheating, of no stealing a life that perfectly kept God's law and and, and God's God's everything to a T. And that when you come to him in faith and you trust in him as your savior, that you will be saved. I know the question that many people have, and it's a good question, and it's a question that needs to be answered, is when I hear people talk about they've been saved, or I hear you, Luke, talking about to be saved, What are you talking about? What do I need to be saved from? It sounds like somebody's coming after me. It sounds like I owe somebody something. And guess what? You do. The wrath of God is coming for you if you do not repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to be saved from from God, from his wrath. 
that will be poured out upon sin forever. See, our sin separates us from God. The foundational doctrine of Christianity is total depravity, that we are born into sin. You're not born neutral. Yes, your babies are adorable and we love them, but they're sinners. I mean, they're, they're, they're sinners. They need, they need to be saved. Now, this is a whole other discussion, but when babies die, do they go to heaven? Absolutely. We'll talk about that in our next q and I promise. Yes, yes, we believe that they do. And I'll point you in scripture to where we do. So we'll leave it at that today. If any ladies in the room have, have lost a child, um, we firmly believe that they are in heaven through God's word. And I'm jumping all around today. I'm a preacher all over the place today. Uh, we'll talk about that in our next Q&A. Dan, remind me. Jerry, remind me. One of us will answer that question next time. I think you already got it on your list, don't you? You think it's one, one you guys are going to answer. But I want to share with you a quote from one of my, one of my favorite pastors, Dr. Stephen Lawson. He says it this way. He says, every sin in the history of the world will be punished by God. And I'll stop and preach for just a second. Here are the two options. Here are the two options. He's going to give you the two options. They will either be punished in Christ or they will be punished in hell. No sin will go unpunished. It's a very incredible quote. Well, let me explain it to you if you don't understand it. If you die in your sins without Jesus, then you will spend eternity separated from his grace, from him forever in a real place called hell. And you will pay for each and every single one of those sins for all eternity in a place, a literal place called hell. Or here's the goodness. (laughs) Here is the good news is that we are all in that boat of being sinners. But see, when Christ died upon the cross, there was a lot of things happening. One, the sins of all of of God's people, all who would ever believe were laid upon him. And when Jesus said on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The father in that moment couldn't even look upon the son because the son was bearing your sin and my sin and all who would ever come to faith in him. And when those sins were laid upon him, it satisfied the holy wrath and the holy judgment of God in full. And that is why when Jesus said his final words, it is finished. He was paying for your sin and for my sin in full. And when he was laid in that tomb and three days later, we know that he rose again and we celebrated that. But if he wouldn't have rose again, he would have just been a phony, right? He wouldn't have been the son of God. He was raised for our righteousness. He was raised that for all who will come to him in faith and repentance, and trusting that he paid for your sins in full is that you will be forgiven. And today I just extend the invitation to you. I plead to you today to share in the joy of salvation, to share with Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, who was the prophesied forerunner to Christ that the Old Testament had pointed to, And Zechariah, if you remember, he had lost his ability to talk because he initially didn't believe the announcement that the angel gave him that his wife, who was old, was going to conceive and have a son. And the judgment that God uh, gave him was that he would not be able to speak. Well, John the Baptist is born, and right after he affirms that his name will be John, he bursts out into this song of praise. And how fitting to not be able to speak for nine months. And then after your son is born, because you didn't believe that he was going to be born, God's spirit prompts you to sing this incredible song, rich in Old Testament theology and doctrine. And for us today to be able to share in the song of celebration with him as well is just a blessing. It's a blessing to be able to be here today. It's a blessing to be able to sing songs of praise. 
It's a blessing to the highest degree to be called a child of God. And today you can be a child of God if you're not, if you will come to faith and repentance in Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven into which be to, uh, for us to be saved. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father through him. And then maybe today you may say, well, I have my faith in Christ, but I, I've never been baptized, and I, I'd love to, 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 to follow through in the waters of baptism. Well, what are you waiting on? You know, you're saved, your faith is in Jesus, but Jesus asked us to follow through and to be baptized, just to proclaim our love for him through the waters of baptism. It is symbolic and it shows uh, the world that you play for God's team, that Jesus is your Lord and that he's your savior.